Right, we're going to try and compress into this session tonight what I did in three sessions last year. So forgive me if I fly through an awful lot of work, because it is quite a bit of work growing seedlings from scratch to plant out in your plots, your gardens, or whatever. So let's get straight into it. Um, first things first, you have seeds, because by now, most people have bought their seeds or got them or whatever. But let me do a plug first. Fredericton Botanical Gardens Association are having a seedy Saturday, this coming Saturday in the afternoon, which won't conflict with the NB Community Harvest Gardens function in the morning. It's at 10 Cameron Court, which is off uh, Hanwell. And $4 entrance for non-members, $2 entrance for members, and you can pick up whatever seeds are there free. They do have a mighty assortment of floral seeds, not quite so much in the vegetable line, but they also have some fantastic knowledge. And they are happy to impart the knowledge. Um, you will have Steve Stehauer there, you'll have Ian Beach there, you'll have uh, Heather Con Connors Dunphy. They're all fantastic people. They're all much more knowledgeable than I am. So please feel free to go there and get as much seed as you like. Uh, it's in the afternoon, I think it's 12 till one four. four. Is it one till four? Thanks, Frank. Yeah, I wasn't quite sure whether it was 12 or one. It's Maybe one. Take the can and uh, something for your food bank. Oh, right, and Frank reminds me that it's something for the food bank. Now, next week, I don't want to take away from here, but I'm talking for the Fredericton Botanical Gardens next week, so I won't be here next week, but you'll have Mike Carr, who is a wonderful organic farmer, and he will be talking about composting and whatever. So, right, so you have some seeds. What are you going to do with them? Are you going to plant them direct, which means that you have to wait till the end of June, or well, the end of May, beginning of June, to actually put them in the ground, some of them, not all of them? Or are you actually going to try and start some of the longer season seeds a couple of weeks early? Because otherwise, you're going to be running into the frost period at the end of September. So we have to consider when we're planting seeds, light, warmth, space, cost, time, and energy. And energy is a major factor, let me tell you. Because a lot of these flipping seeds take quite a lot of time. And um, if you haven't got the energy, it can be awful getting there at 10 o'clock at night and thinking, oh, I didn't water the seeds today. And they're all going flop. And it doesn't help. So those are things that one has to consider. So while we go through this presentation, I'll see what I can do about talking about those things. First thing we talk about is pots, because obviously you've got to get your seedlings going in some form of medium. So the professionals, you'll often buy these sort of things. They're fine if you've got a little seed ball and you're going to plant out from them into a bigger pot. So that's the consideration with these. Okay, These are known as speedling seedling trays. And you can get them in, in strips like this, or you can get them in little six packs. But the deeper, the better. right? Um, they're available at any of the, the major seed stores or the, the garden places. Um, this is a, a deeper version. As you can see, it's got quite a lot more space in its it's what the professionals tend to use for growing, initial growing of a lot of the seedlings that they're going to sell you later on in the season. And then they put them on a pillory matting, which is a wet mat, and on, in these sort of trays. And the seeds actually soak up the water through the roots on, uh, out of the matting. It's sort of a, it's almost aquaponic, hydroponic situation that they, they tend to grow. Most of us don't have the luxury of that sort of thing. So we use what are called flats. This is a flat. It doesn't have holes in it, except when the mice get it and start, or, or I drop it and break it. Um, this is a very useful thing to start a lot of seedlings in if you're going to you know, do what I do sort of semi-professionally. But the only thing with them is you are going to be putting yourself at risk of damping off disease, which is when you get too much water collecting and it tends to create a fungal situation and the whole, the, the, it gets a little grey fungus on the, on the sort of bottom of the stem against the soil and the whole plant just goes blop and it dies and 
cannot do anything. You just have to chuck up a whole lot and start again. So that's the problem with a flat. It doesn't have any form of filtration of water at the bottom. So they either dry out too much or they get too wet. So be careful of them. Quite often the best thing to do is to take these sort of size because then you don't have to plant across, or you don't have to pot up, which is moving things from this sort of thing into this too often because plants don't really like being transplanted all that much. And you can fit six, I think it's, no, it's 15 of these into a flat. So you can have 15 of these. And to start with, you can put two or three lettuces in this and then prick them out or whatever. So that's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is to get jiffy pots, which, or these sort of type of pots. These are actually um, decomposable. The only thing with these is if you're using them, when you come to actually transplant out into the ground, cut them down the side so that the roots can move up. Because some of the plant's roots cannot get through these. These are a bit too thick for plant roots to go through. So cut them down the side so that the roots can actually move out. So that's that. Um, the other is clay pots. Now, clay is lovely because plastic, there's always the fear that you might get a little contamination out of plastic, a bit of leaching from the plastic. Scientifically, you know, it's not BPA-free. Let's put it this way. Most of these things are not BPA-free. Clay, the only problem with clay is the clay itself, these pots, absorb a lot of water. So they tend to dry your plants out a little, your seedlings out. But I like using them, but I don't have that many of them. I, I tend to drop them and break them. They're very good for pot shards in the bottom of a pot. Um, there is a, a new professional little beastie called a jiffy pellet, which looks like that when it comes out of the box. It swells to about three times its size and it has a little sort of opening that you fit the seed into. The plant roots can grow through this, but I didn't have great success with these last year, especially with tomatoes. Tomatoes didn't seem to do too well because they only grow about an inch, an inch and a half high, two inches high, and then you'll need to put those into another pot later on. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna actually transplant those in, into a pot of one of the other mediums. I'm not that keen on them, but other people seem to have great success with them, so maybe I'm doing it wrong. But they'll actually, they actually come um, with a flat of their own, and they come with very good instructions on the back. So if you're trying anything out, it's worth trying those. Okay, so that's basically seeds. Now, if you're not going to spend the money on those sort of things, there are other things. This is a Swiffer sweeper box. Okay, you can use anything. You don't have to. Um, people use cut-off pop bottles. You know, it's, it's not necessary to buy this. You can use all sorts of household things. These come with a transparent top, which is actually quite useful, because then you start your seeds, you leave the transparent top on until the seeds germinate, and away you go. But again, no holes in the bottom unless you make them. So be aware of that. A great too. Some of them do, yeah. Depends on the quality, uh, whether you're using the styrene ones or whether you're using the, the, the sort of this type of, yeah. Um, again, they're really good for small, small plants, but when you get to bean seed that is the size of a whole bean, they're a little bit small, because <laughs> they won't allow, they won't allow the root development. So that's another thing you've got to look at. So we're looking at peat, which is, these, these are basically made of peat, most of them. Um, there are cow manure pots, which are very sexy, but very expensive. You can even make pots out of newspaper. If you're good with origami, there are plenty of sites online which will tell you how to make origami plant pots that are about so size. And I'm useless to origami, so <laughs> don't ask me to make them. <laughs> okay. But again, watch out with um, newspaper. Use the good old newsprint. Don't use the, the flashy... Um, very shiny stuff that's got lots of colour on it because the colour ink leaches out into the whatever you're using as your planting medium and you can, in fact, kill your plants with that. Okay, so Jiffy products we've looked at, plastic including the flats, clay we've looked at, milk cartons, just the ordinary old half litre milk carton, fabulous. They're really good. And if you're going to try growing in plastic bags, try not to use clear plastic bags because roots do not like light. So anything that's going to root downwards, or if you're using um, uh, plastic cups, use the coloured ones, don't use the clear ones. 
Okay, so plastic cups are perfectly good. Just make a hole in the bottom and they're fine. Right, so there's your pots. Now, fill them with something. Okay, this something is very, very important. You'll need a starting mix. You're not going to go out in the garden and dig up something because it's going to have bacteria in it. It's going to have fungi in it. It's also probably, because New Brunswick has a very clay soil, it's probably going to be very compact and your seeds are not going to have the space for root development that you need. So this is where I say, spend the money, it's worth it. Okay, so you can buy seed starting mix. There are various varieties of it. Um, if you really want to be organic, look for the OMRI, O-M-R-I seal, which is the certified organic. Okay, um, this costs about six dollars something. So, but it'll do quite a lot of seeds, I can tell you that. It is ready to use, it's pH balanced, it's got peat moss and compost and perlite in it, and it's pretty good. If you want to do bigger quantities, you can buy the ingredients yourself. You can buy the perlite, which looks like that in the bag. That bag is normally about, it's a nine meter bag, and it's normally about, again, seven, seven ninety nine or something like that. You'll need that, and you'll need vermiculite. Now, these are both expanded rock at very, very high temperatures. One is volcanic, the other is not. Um, what they've done is they've expanded that rock, and it looks like, when it comes out of the bag, this is vermiculite, it looks like little gold particles, sort of slightly, slightly flashy, and the perlite is white. The more of that you get in a starting soil or a starting mix, the better it is because this is the one that holds the water and this is the one that expands and gives you the aeration that you will need for your seeds to have a proper bed to work in. Peat moss looks like that. I'll pass all these around. The other thing that people are starting to use quite extensively is coconut. The, the outer husk of a coconut is known as coir. Can anybody remember going to boarding school in coir mattresses? They were horrible things way back in the 60s when I was at boarding school we had these thin mattresses and they were lumpy and they were hard they were actually made out of coconut husks. you know them <laughs> like, yeah. well, about in the 60s. no <laughs> 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 yes yeah, so that gives, that ages me doesn't it right yeah so coir um, you can get it it looks like this it's called beyond peat now there are those that don't like us using peat because peat takes about 200 years to break down but of course, Canada, especially New Brunswick, produces about 40% of the world's peat at the moment. And that's up near, uh, up the north uh, central part of the province. This, they contend, is um, equivalent to three cubic feet of peat moss, which is quite a big bag, I can tell you. And the contention is that because we have so many coconuts in the world, especially down in the tropics, which they're husking off, they're taking this stuff off and just throwing it away, it's much better for the environment to, to take the coconut husk and the coir. Anybody who's grown amaryllis in pots, did you get amaryllis for Christmas in pots? This is what they actually put in that pot as the starter soil. And it's, it's really good. So that's what it looks like. It's available at Home Hardware. I took most of their stock the other day. <laughs> I'm hoping that they've got some by now. Now they've got... Um, Beyond peat, and there's another one which is something else, peat, which is not the one that you want to start with seeds. Okay, so let's pass these around. Um, oh, yeah, we'll come back to that in a moment. Sunshine mix number four um, is what the professional guys like George Scott use. Well, the sunshine mix is two, four, six, eight, is what they use to, to grow in greenhouses, and that's what that looks like. Um, but again, that's a huge big bale, and it costs $24.99 a bale. It's called Sunshine Mix Number Four, and it's available at the Co-op Country Store up here on St Mary's. Yeah, but it's expensive, but it's really good stuff. Yeah, um, this is chicken grit, and that is what you put if you start getting slightly green-looking soil um, because it's not quite in as enough as much light as you would like. Put a little bit of chicken grit on the top when you plant your seedlings, when you plant your seeds, that will stop that green developing. 
that was a, a, a hint I got from somebody at the Frederick Botanical Gardens Association the other day, because I went to his seed sowing talk, because I always wanted them. Anyway, so these are coming up. Can I ask a question? Yeah. What is chicken food? Chicken food. Um, it is literally grit that the chickens will eat, and it helps them produce calcium to produce nice, solid egg shells. Oysters. Like yeah, it's like oysters. oysters. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's like oyster shell. Okay. Yeah. But that's just the cheap version. <laughs> right. Um, that's also available. It's a, if anybody wants me to bring smaller amounts, because I bought a 50 pound bag the other day, I, I can bring in probably enough. You know, I'll bring it in next time I talk, which is April, mid, mid April. By the way, the chicken Yeah, the chicken grid at sure gains quite a bit bigger in, in yeah. diameter. Yeah, this is actually, you can get chick grit and you can get layer grit. The chick grit is very, very small diameter. The layer grit is much bigger. Yeah. So, it also, you know, obviously with chickens, it helps them grow good solid bones and it's, 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 it's a calcium additive. And it, it helps with planting as well because it's calcium, basically. So um, people do use sand um, as part of these mixes. Um, the only problem with sand is you have to be a little careful that it's not got salt added into it. You know, track sand and these things quite often have salt in them, so you're going to kill your plants if you're not careful. Um, and it can cause compaction of the soil if you put too much sand in. So don't put too much sand in. Then when you're planting potting on, this is the growing mix. This is the next, from this mix that we're, we're talking about here. From that mix, you go onto this mix when you're potting up. Um, this one will actually, if you're going to keep your stuff in containers right through the year, this is the one that you would use because it's really good. And it's, it's got food in it. This stuff has absolutely no food value for your plants at all. It's just to get them going. It's purely a medium in which they will grow roots and grow a shoot. This is the stuff that has got food in it. It's, it's a pH balance and it's got a certain amount of uh, nitrogen and phosphorus and calium, uh, uh, potassium in it. Right, so if you want to make your own mixes, you buy bits and bits and bits and start mixing. So you'll need, for a starter mix, in other words, to replicate this here, you can use one part sphagnum moss or coir, that coconut base, one part vermiculite, one part perlite. It will give you no nutrient. And to make it up, you actually need to add enough water that it's just like a, a little bit of a sponge. It's not sopping, sopping wet. It's not like your basement last night after the floods. Right. Don't wet it. Just keep it moist. It, to prevent damping off disease, my daughter sent this to me from England because she's just a couple of weeks ahead of us because obviously it's, it's warmer in England. Use cinnamon. Yeah, just sprinkle it on top. It is an antifungus. It's an antifungal. Oh, one thing I forgot when you're doing your pots. If you're using pots that you used last year, please wash them out thoroughly and use hydrogen peroxide to do so. You can use Clorox, Javex, whatever. Um, that will kill 99% of bacteria. This will kill the fungus. So it's quite useful to, to do it in both, but don't do both at once because you'll have an explosion. <laughs> okay. So hydrogen peroxide, any chemist, this is from um, <coughs> Superstore. It's 10% dilute, one tablespoon to one liter. And, the, and with the chlorine base, you would dilute one teaspoon to one liter and wash your pots out and make sure that they are well cleaned because you might be bringing diseases in that developed over the, the previous year. 10% 10 10 of the hydro, this, this is a 10% dilution and one <coughs> tablespoon to one liter. Yeah. Uh, you can get a, a, a heavier dilution, uh, 70, 70 and 90, I wouldn't use those. They're, they're, they're really tough, but this is the one that you know, use for bleaching hair and things like that. <laughs> okay, right, so um, now this is the growing on mix. So when your seedlings are at a stage where they can be moved on because they're getting too tight in whatever they've started out in, you'll use two parts commercial potting soil, one part peat moss or coir, one part sand, this is where you can use sand or perlite, 
Um, this is all in that uh, handout, by the way. You don't need to write it down. And you moisten it all before you transplant. And if green moss is a problem, I've already spoken about the, the chick grit. So that stops the growth. Okay, so understand the seed packet. That's one of the things that is quite important. You'll get your seeds in a packet unless you get them from me. <laughs> or if you get them on a seed swap, you sometimes get them in a packet. Don't get them in a packet. Um, Fredericton is zone 4B or zone 5 to zone 5. Depends on the season somewhat. 4B is the cooler seasons, 5 is... So if you're going to start trying to grow things that are zone 8, 9, and 10, which is sort of way down Florida, <laughs> it's not going to work. <laughs> well, it's not going to work easily. Some people can get away with it. After all, tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, um, uh, sweet potatoes, they are all either subtropical or tropical plants. And we're trying to grow them here. So this is why we have to start them early. That's why they need this long season. And that's why they need to be full-grown plants by the time we get going, trying to get to harvest by June, well, by July and August and September. So the outdoor growing season here is between roughly May the 22nd and September the 22nd. That's your last frost and your first frost. May the 22nd? to about September the 22nd. Luckily, our growing season is extending every year, slightly, but not that much, not that much. So um, it, it gives us approximately 17 to 20 weeks, approximately 120 to 140 days. So if you start planting things like leeks in June, their season is 150 days. If you're lucky, you'll still be harvesting them up to December, but you know, it's good to start leaks right now so that you can get them. So looking at this, um, just a couple of uh, abbreviations that you might not know. A hardy annual, HA is direct sown outside. A half hardy annual, this is mostly flowers rather than uh, vegetables, is start inside and keep them going. A hardy biennial, a biennial is a plant that grows for the first year it just grows. The second year, it flowers, fruits, seeds, whatever. Parsley in the vegetable line is a biennial. A lot of biennial um, flowers as well. A hardy perennial, you can sow direct outside. And a half hardy perennial, you'll need to start inside. And the perennials are the ones that will come up again and again. They'll die back in the winter, but they'll come back every year. That's a lot of the flowers that you'll see around here that people grow. Okay, so start inside for sure. These are the ones that I start inside. Other people start other things. Leeks, onions, if you're trying to grow onions from seed. Quite honestly, I don't. I just go and buy the sets, which are the little baby onions that somebody else has started, stop them growing, and you plant them and get them growing again. That's the, the quickest way to grow onions. Onions from seed is hard work. The cold crops or brassicas. Um, that's kale, Brussels sprouts, cauliflowers, cabbage, collards. And there's a picture of rapini. I was talking about rapini last week. Does anybody recognize it now? Yeah. It's really nice, and it's, it's very easy to grow. It's as easy to grow as broccoli. Um, so the cold crops all need to be started inside, um, and in reasonably cool temperatures as well. Uh, because your Brussels sprouts are going to take you right into the end of the season. If you, you know, far into the end of the season, they might get frosted. Obviously, tomatoes, basil, and par parsley, peppers, eggplants, um, lettuces. We're gonna, I'm actually going to plant up some lettuces with that mix shortly, as a sort of demonstration. Some of the early lettuces. It's nice to start them early, then you can put them out, and they'll they'll grow into good heads by mid mid June, the end of June. Melons and squashes. Again, they need that warmth to germinate, they need that warmth to grow on, and they need that warmth when you get them out in mid-June, then they will actually possibly fruit for you. But it depends on the season again. I, I had watermelons that were sort of that size last year, even though it was hot. But that's my fertility, not, not a matter of those. Okay, start outside. 
Early May if the soil is not waterlogged. If you started with the garden here a couple of years back when we were actually starting the garden here, you'll remember that that was one soggy spring. And it was extremely hard work and we didn't actually get into the garden, am I right, until halfway through June? Yeah, it, actually we were planting into July. So please don't work your soil if it's wet because you'll damage your soil. You will actually, if you went out today after yesterday's rain, apart from the fact that it's still frozen an inch or two down, if you tried to work your soil today, you would have been damaging your soil. If you walked on it or if you had actually tried to work it, you would be compacting it. And do you remember last week we talked about compacted soil? I'll be talking about weeds and what they can tell us in a couple of weeks' time. Dandelions show you that your soil is too compacted. So if you've got masses of dandelions, you've probably got compacted soil, you need to actually dig it up and aerate it. Okay, early ones that you can plant, I wouldn't start planting these until probably the last frost date, May the 22nd outside. Peas, carrots, beets are a bit iffy at that time, chard, potatoes, and radishes. The earlier you get your potatoes in, the more chance you have of them growing to a reasonable size before the dear old Colorado potato beetle hits. And I have Colorado potato beetle so it comes out of my ears. Crop rotation, we'll come to that in a minute. Later, in early June, your warmer soils, beans of any sort, spinach, corn, onions, and any of the choy family, uh, the bok choy, pak choy, ooh, there are plenty of them. Um, the, the, the Chinese cabbage, the really nice Chinese cabbage. Transplant in mid-June. These are the plants that you started round about now, into April, into May, and you're going to transplant in June. Everything that you've grown inside. Now you need to harden it off first. Hardening off means going and taking these plants. This is where energy comes in. Taking them outside in the morning, putting them in a direct light but not bright sunlight nice direct light spot but not bright sunlight because they've just come out of a, a place where it's dark at night and fairly fairly dark inside the house so you're going to put them out for the day you're going to take them back inside at night because they're still not really used to breezes and wind can play a huge huge factor it's a big factor in plants transpiring and flopping because they're, they're, they're wilting because they're, they're, transpiring, they're transpiring too much. Um, they're not used to the direct light and they're just sort of going, hey, what's this? You know, we've been coddled, we've been looked after, we've been pampered, and now suddenly, <gasps> you know, help! It's like going from junior school to high school or high school to university, possibly even worse, because after all, you're still being spoon-fed to a certain degree at, at school, you get to university, and they're saying to you, right, the assignment's got to be in on that date, and there's nobody pushing you. Yeah, so harden them off first. We'll come back to that in a minute. Watering and covering. Now, we're going back to actual, when we're at the seed stage, and as I said, you water too little, the, she the seeds will shrivel and die. Seeds are, after all, an embryo in a casing. That's what they are. That embryo has to be watered to get it to break the casing open and to grow. And as I said last week, if you're going to try and grow sweet peas, you actually need to scrape that casing so that they can break that casing, because that casing is very, very hard. And there are a lot of um, nut trees and some of the floral stuff you actually have to, to what's called scarify it. You have to actually rub it up against a a piece of sandpaper or something like that to, to actually get the seed casing so that the, the embryo can break through. Too much water, they'll flop over, they'll die, they'll go rotten. So this is, this is the fine line. And it's always, I don't get it right, I can assure you I am not the perfect person on that sort of thing. Um, covering your seeds. So if you're going to plant a seed that is the size of a bean. These are pole beans, by the way. Um, that's the red scarlet runner, and this is the white flowered one. You're going to plant them so that little white mark, which is actually where the roots and the, the stem will come from, 
is facing downwards. Okay? You're not going to plant them so that they're like that. The pictures show you like that, and they show that the, the actually plant across. But you're going to cover those to three times their depth. The, the rule of thumb is any seed that you've got, cover it to three times the depth, unless it is a seed that likes to grow in light. And that's lettuces. Lettuces don't like being covered, actually. They want to be on top. Right, so that's, that's an issue. Because um, obviously, you know, if we start with top size, we go down to pumpkin size. Then we can go right down to, and this is how I do small seeds. Um, this is actually mescaline lettuce. I actually tip it into one of these. And if, you, if you're not good with your hands, one way of doing it is literally picking it up and sort of rolling it through your thumb and forefinger as you put them out, and you can sort of get them spread out quite nicely. But if you're not good at that, either buy one of those little seed sowers, which is a little round thing that's got a sort of funnel off the side, or use an old spice bottle and use the top, and it will spread quite nicely for you. So that's just a little tip on spreading seeds a bit more easily. Um, I've got cilantro here, which obviously is round, so that makes life slightly complicated because you've got to decide what the you know three times its its width its diameter um, and I've also got and you're welcome to come and collect any of these from me at the end um, these will spares I've also got what's called galadia which is actually a flower um, it's a perennial it's uh, also known as blanket flower you might know it as blanket flower it grows very well and it's it's very easy to grow yellow and red, um, and it's got a sort of pin cushion. This is the seed head in the middle. Um, they grow nicely and they grow easily, and they're very good for bees. So that's why I brought them along. So please feel free to come and help yourselves at the end. I've got extra bags. Um, I haven't got enough of those. But this is basically for people who've got the space or want to grow things that will go up with. The, uh, these seeds are a mix of Hubbard squash, well, they're the winter squashes. They're the Hubbard and the acorn. So I can't tell you which. There'll be a bit of a mystery squash for you. Um, and as I said, these are the pole beans, and they will go 8, 10 foot tall. But wonderful. If you've got the space for hummingbirds, they love the red ones, which are the dark ones. They absolutely love <coughs> buzzing up to them, and they're, they're, they're the actual pollinators for, for pole, pole beans. Right, so that's those. Um, so we've had a look at that, watering and covering, we've had a look at, yeah, back of the seed packet, normally we'll tell you, um, they've got wonderful directions, most of the seed packets, they will actually tell you, direct sow in direct seed in early spring, sow thickly in wide rows or in beds, cover lightly about quarter an inch, babies, telling you about mescaline, which is the baby leaf lettuce, the one that you cut and it comes again, um, plant every one or two weeks to ensure a continued harvest, uh, and it gives you the pH soil of the soil. It gives you what to do with the pests and diseases. And it even some of them give you the companion plants, which is really useful. So have a look at the back of the seed packet, um, or actually go into the seed catalogs. They, they normally have growing hints as well. Bees definitely do. Um, or is it? No, it's OSC, I think. Uh, yeah, here's about onions. If you're going to grow onions from seed, it's got a whole little table on spacing and everything else. So they're pretty good. So um, so that's that. This is a beautiful picture of dumping off disease. Unfortunately, let's see if I can get this a little bit close. I've got this off the um, This is begonias. Somebody's trying to uh, grow begonias with slips. But as you'll see in the middle of that picture, um, there are the collapsed plants because they've been, they've been wetted too much. And if you go to the original of this, um, the in from the right, the second of the cells there has a nasty green moss growing on it. And that is what dumping off disease looks like. It's not a pretty sight. If you get that, destroy everything. Just chuck it completely. You can't reuse the soil because it's a fungus that's got into the soil and it has wiped out your plants. So don't try drying the soil out and reusing it because it, it'll come back again. Well, um, if you baked it at 280 for about four hours, you might manage to. But have you ever smelled 
soil being baked at 280. <laughs> it is not a nice smell. It'll run you out the house. <laughs> never tried that, Frank, so I don't know. Um, phone Bob Osborne at Cornhill, because he's the person who taught me about this. Yeah. And he actually, I know that he sprays his, all his greenhouses before he starts the year. He sprays his greenhouses with, a, with actually a, less, uh, with a, a, a much heavier dilution of that. So, yeah, commercially. Um, but he might be the person to talk to you to, to, to about that, because I really don't know the ins and outs of it. I just know that I wash all my, my stuff out with it. All right, so potting on. When your plants are a little bit too big, they need air, they need more food, they need possibly more water, they need more light, they need space to fill out, and they need a richer soil. That's why we're starting to move on to the actual growing mix that I gave you as the second mix. And air, is, air movement is actually very important. If they're sort of squashed into a little corner, they tend to stagnate. And that's, again, when you're going to get more of the damping off problems. So that is something to think about. And your transplant technique. Now, I find these are the two most useful things ever for transplanting inside, you know, the, the small parts. I inherited this from somebody previous to me, so I don't know where she got it, um, but it is wonderful because it's, it's small enough to deal with. You don't want a great big trowel when you're trying to, you know, pick out the odd plant. So if not, just use an ordinary fork. Wonderful things. Okay, those are the tools. Um, if you're transplanting, you need to do it quickly. You can't leave a, a transplant that you've taken out you can't just leave it with its roots sort of lying around in one of these trays because those roots are going to dry out. The moment the roots dry out, you have a problem with your, your plants. You need to get those transplants done as quickly as possible. Don't touch the stem. The stem is the method by which the roots send food up to the leaves. And the leaves send other types of food back down to the, the roots. It's, I'm sure you remember your biology lessons, right? Try not to touch the stem. Pick things up by the edge of a leaf if you can, or by the root ball, and get a good grip underneath the root ball and pick it up like that. Because otherwise, A, you're going to lose all the, the uh, soil around that root ball, and you need to transplant as much of the soil around the root ball as possible. And if you've got a long-rooted thing that suddenly decided it's going to grow a root that's that long, and you're going to try and put it into even a pot this size, put the pot on, the side, on its side, lay the pot on its side, put the roots in so that they are fully extended, and then start filling back your soil, whatever you're using, and then pick them up, and then pick it up straight. It will mean that you don't get the situation where the roots sort of form a coil and just sit at the bottom of the pot. So if you're going to grow um, tomatoes or anything like that, and you're going to leave them in the container, as long as possible, you're going to need something as deep as that, if you can. Yeah. And the other thing is, um, these are readily available. Uh, if you go and see Aldana at Sobeys on Regent, she has all her flowers arrive in these buckets, in these pails. They are wonderful. Just, you should give them away for me. You put your whatever size pot you're going to use, put it in there, and you can then, because it's not quite the same size, you can get your water down the bottom instead of watering from the top and possibly causing leaf damage if you're watering with fertilizers and things like that. So go down, go down the side and it'll sit at the bottom. The roots will draw up the water and you're good. Okay, um, so you're going to set your seedlings very slightly deeper than they were growing. They tend to like that. And watch out, don't put them straight back into direct sun when you've done a bit of transplanting. Try and keep them away from a directly sunny um, window ledge or something like that and for a couple of days so that they've got time to settle down. It's called transplant shock. And you're trying to mitigate the shock by A, not touching them as far as possible, B, putting them in a medium that's 
moist but not sopping wet, and C, not putting them into direct sun. And that also applies when you're going right outside at the end. Um, you can lift your grow light. Yeah, lift, try, try and sort of bring them to the edge of the grow lights for the first couple of days, and then you know lift your grow light and get them going. All right, preferably not to transplant inside. Go for a bigger pot to start with, and then go straight outside. Beans. Well, most most uh, books say don't even try starting beans inside, but I do. I do half my beans inside, half my beans outside. Um, all the Chinese cabbages, all the choys, try not to transplant them. You know, grow them, grow individually in these, and they will last until you can get them out. Um, corn, I wouldn't even try. <laughs> I, I don't grow my corn inside. I know people do grow corn inside, and people grow carrots inside. I, I just don't. Um, corn, as far as I'm concerned, goes straight in the ground. It's a grass. It grows a flat root system. So the, the corn stalk's there, the root system's like this. It doesn't go down, it goes flat. And it's very difficult to transplant something like that. Cucumbers, melons, squash pumpkins, most of the root crops, um, just, well, root crops, because they are so dependent on the root being really, really important to them, like turnips and kohlrabi and things like that, it's best to take them. If you're gonna try and grow them inside, then take them straight and uh, it's probably best to grow root crops and this sort of thing. And then all you do is, as I say, slip down the side and the roots are there and they're, they're going. Okay, plant in the biggest containers you can find space for and the biggest space that you've got. Watering. Never use cold, cold water. I have a very, very cold well. In fact, it almost freeze, freezes on me when it was really, really cold. Try and use water that's lukewarm warm to the hand. So it's, 20, it's about 21 degrees centigrade, because otherwise you're going to shock your plants. Okay? Try not to use chlorinated water. Well, obviously, Fredericton water is chlorinated. The water that we have here off the roof is fine, because that's great. Chlorinated water, if you're going to use it on plants, leave it overnight. It, the chlorine tends to escape because it forms a gas and just gets out of the water. Water softener water, don't touch. Please don't touch it. It's got salt in it. Water softeners have salt in them, and obviously it's going to be too salty. And as I said before, try and water most of your seedlings from the bottom, um, if possible. And there's a little picture there. It's not very clear. Um, and again, I've got a slight issue with that one. It's, it's a nice concept, because you've got the glass with the, with the cap. Um, but they've used clear pop bottles, which isn't very wise. You know, try and use coloured bottles or whatever if you can. But it's just, it's, it's a nice concept. Humidity. This is another thing. Your leaves are transpiring and taking in water all the time from the air. And especially when they're small plants, you've got to try and keep your room humidity up to about at least 50%. And germination is about 80% if you can. Or it's really, you know, the room's almost dripping from the ceilings and the walls. Um, and when you've put it on at about 50 to 70%, lots of people use these plastic tents. Just get some ordinary, get a, a sheet of plastic, and if you've got a hook in your ceiling, just hang it from the ceiling and hang it around all your plants. That will make it a pretty good. But there again, you can get too much humidity and you'll get your damping off problems. So again, it's the fine line. Um, if you can't do the plastic tent, what you can do is put water in shallow dishes next to a fan or a heater and get the, the heater element up so that your temperature, your temperature in, in your seed room, if you're going to use a specific room for seeds, should be between 20 and 25 for germination. You can drop it to about 15 after that. I'm talking centigrade. So for germination, you're looking normally at quite a hot temperature in the room. Um, and you'll see on, in the handout, you'll see the, the optimum germination temperatures for certain of the seeds. It's on page four, I think. Okay, so that's how you get around the humidity situation. That's actually a picture of somebody who's got a, a sort of formed a tent around their seeds. Fertilizer. So, you've got your little seed come up. He's got one set of leaves. 
and he's just about to grow a second set of leaves, this is when you start fertilizing. You either transplant him at that stage or you start fertilizing. And I tend to use this stuff. It's a liquid fish fertilizer with seaweed extract. So it's got both the kelp in it and it's got the fish. And it's been deodorized, so you're not going to get too much of a really nasty smell of rotten fish, which can be horrible. I actually know somebody who plants uh, his roses on dead fish. But this is outside, admitted. And he has the most wonderful roses you've ever seen. He gets fish entrails, and he gets all the scales and everything else, puts it right down underneath the roses, and the roses just go, whee! Wonderful. But um, this is easier. Let's put it that way. So it's uh, organic. It's made in PEI, so it's local to the Maritimes. Hooray. It's called Gardener's Dream. You can get another one called Neptune's something or other, Neptune's Dream or something like that. Um, it used to have that it had, that the ratio was 2 nitrogen to 4 P, which is uh, phosphorus. And it used to have one potassium, but I see that they've changed it to 240. So the, they've changed the, the setup slightly. So, yeah, so it's got nitrogen, for phosphoric acid, potash, and organic matter, 21% organic matter in this. Um, dilution as per the, the bottle, it's, it's really, really good. And even when you're transplanting out into the patch, into your, your final, it's very useful. And it's very good for tomatoes. Yes. Uh, yes. So this actually, this this can be used either for roots or foliar. Yeah. Um, now spray misting is you, you go down to the dollar store and buy one of those little spray bottles, like you would use for jiff or whatever in, in in your kitchen, and um, you use it very very lightly because you don't want to wet your leaves too much. But that's, if you're using a foliar feed, that is, well, one of, this is a foliar or a bottom watering type feed. So foliar feeds are, they are actually, the, the, the food is taken in through the leaves, through the little chlorophyll cells. So that, uh, I do normally one or the other, yeah. And I, I tend not to be too good on spray misting because I either overdo it or underdo it. So tend to go for the bottom feed. <laughs> and again, um, depending on the plant, not more than weekly. Um, you won't, otherwise you'd just be wasting, you'll be throwing money down the drain. Light. When you are actually starting your seeds from this sort of situation here, where you, you literally this, unless it's a seed that grows totally in the dark, and there are a few, um, you're going to need 16 hours light a day. You're going to pretend that it's midsummer, and that's this is what's trying to, you know, going to get them really going. So if you've got the grow lights, um, or even a good incandescent light, leave it on for 16 hours a day. It sounds crazy. You know. You're thinking, but hold on, it's only spring, it's only just coming up to 11, 12 hours a day light. But actually the seeds will benefit by 16 hours light a day. So ensure strong light, in other words, a south-facing window, not a north-facing window. That's quite difficult for most people because... Uh, all of us have houses that face the wrong way quite often. If you don't have natural light, don't worry too much. You can use grow lights or full spectrum lights. Um, they are, well, you can actually get an LED grow light now, but I haven't got them. I've got the old fluorescent tubes that are four foot long. And I was reading a book the other day where they said use one of the, uh, and it's normally a, a sort of double tier, a double bank of these lights. She was saying use one cool light, which is a, a very yellow light, and one full spectrum light or a grow light, which is a very pink light, because then you get the full spectrum of all types of light that these plants will grow in. So keep them at a keep the, the lights at about four inches above the seedlings. It stops them going and getting very leggy, and then they just you know they tend to, to, to get very sort of spinny and not good. Hardening off. Uh, how are we doing for time? Yeah, we're not too good. We're not too bad. Two weeks before planting out, you will fertilize them well. You will water them well. You will take them outside by day into bright light, but not full sun. You increase daily. Well, that's fine if you don't work. You know, most of us work. So we can't be there to have one hour 
for three days, two hours for the next day, uh, the next three days, three hours for the next five days. You know, it just doesn't work. <laughs> so pop them out. But try to, if, if it's going to be really cool, don't bother. It's, it's not worth it. Bring them in at night, obviously, especially, especially if it's going to be cool or frosty. And we do get these late frosts occasionally. We thought we got rid of the snow. It looks like we're going to have uh, the same 30, millimeters, uh, 30 centimeters of snow next Tuesday. So don't put your plants up. <laughs> Planting out. Ensure that your seedlings are well watered. Try and choose a cloudy or drizzly day uh, or the late afternoon. If you can't do that, go to the late afternoon. Plant out in the late afternoon because they will have the night to settle. If you're going to plant in the morning, they're going to get bright sunlight on them. They're going to go, oh, what are we doing? Your hole would be slightly bigger than the pot that you are trying to take them out of, obviously, because you're going to mix a bit of compost in the bottom, or you're going to mix a little bit of ordinary edible oats. Edible oats is a wonderful, wonderful root stimulant. So take, you know, just get some ordinary breakfast oats. It's not, not the steel cut or the, the full grain, but just the, the flat oats, you know, the, the rolled oats. Put it at the bottom of the thing. And as I say, these, split them down the side and make sure that these are below surface level. Because otherwise, what they're going to do is they're going to wick this, wick the water up that you put around your plants. And they're just going to always take out the water that the, the roots should be getting. So. Um, when seedling is in the hole, make sure that you firm it down, but don't shove it down. Just firm it down because it's going to want to have contact. The roots are going to have contact with the soil around them. That's what they need. They don't want to be sort of floating around in an airy, fairy sort of spot because they're not going to grow nicely. Make a watering dish. In other words, just make a slight indent around the, the plant, but be careful that it's not that deep that your stem is going to be stuck in a puddle because otherwise again you're going to get rotting a situation where they rot so it's just a slight indent in the soil so that when the water is flowing down whichever way you're watering it's going to come to the plant it's not going to sort of go off along another channel and this is another little tip um, if you're transplanting stuff make yourself a fairly well, that same hand warm sugar water solution, which is two tablespoons to two liters of water, that sugar is carbon. Plants are of themselves carbon. It just helps transplants, it helps with mitigating transplant shock again. So it's just when you, the first watering that you do when you transplant those seedlings into the ground, just do it with the sugar water. It helps. Okay, so there's one other very important issue that you need to think about, especially in small plots, is called crop rotation. Basically, you're trying not to grow things in the same spot as you grew them last year. This is to stop diseases. It's to also, because certain plants take out of the soil certain nutrients, if you plant them in the same spot every year, they're going to absolutely kill your soil. Whereas other plants put nutrients back into the soil, like beans and peas. All the legumes are wonderful for actually feeding back into the soil because they, they have in their roots, um, it's called rhizobium, and it's a form of um, growth where they attract nitrogen-fixing bacteria. It, it's fairly complicated science, so I'm not going to go into detail about it, but that will help the rest of your plants grow. So if you're going to grow beans there this year, plant your tomatoes there next year because they will appreciate that extra nitrogen that the beans and peas have left behind. So your crop rotation, try and grow your um, leaves, your cabbage and your lettuce in one spot, your fruits, in other words, anything that you would use in a lasagna or a soup in another spot, except your... Um, uh, uh, yeah, that, that sort of things like your tomatoes and your, your eggplants and whatever. Your roots would be things like parsley, carrots, um, onions, and not onions, and garlic in another spot. 
and then the rebuild things are the peas and the beans and even corn and potatoes, although corn is quite a heavy feeder in itself. And if you're trying to break in new soil, potatoes. Potatoes are the most wonderful things for actually getting your soil what we call friable, which is actually the... It, so, your crop rotation, try and grow your um, leaves, your cabbage and your lettuce in one spot, your fruits, in other words, anything that you would use in a lasagna or a soup in another spot, except your... Um, uh, uh, yeah, that, that sort of thing, like your tomatoes and your, your eggplants and whatever. Your roots would be things like parsley, carrots, um, onions, and not onions, and garlic in another spot. And then the rebuild things are the peas and the beans, and even corn and potatoes, although corn is quite a heavy feeder in itself. And if you're trying to break in new soil, potatoes. Potatoes are the most wonderful things for actually...